My name is Jennifer Wild. I'm the Deputy Director for Engagement here. I'm delighted you could join us for tonight's ROM Connects, um, which is generally supported by the Schmidt family and the Dan Mishra South Asia Initiative. We, get, we begin by acknowledging that Ram sits on the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, which includes the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, from time immemorial to today. Today, when I say these words, I am reminded that I am a descendant settler of European ancestry on Turtle Island. I'm continually learning about the, gener the generosities and the violences in history that have contributed to my being here. And I recommit to using my leadership position to work with others on increasing understanding and mending harms. For those of you who have not had a chance to see it yet, the exhibition Being and Belonging, Contemporary Women Artists from the Islamic World and Beyond is a bold exploration of the defining issues of our time from the perspective of 25 women artists who were born in or connected to a vast region spanning across West Africa to Southeast Asia. Many of the artists live in the diaspora in Canada, the USA, the UK, and across Europe. The exhibition integrates themes of identity, belonging, migration, power, gender, and spirituality through outstanding works from an intergenerational group of living women artists. The exhibition has been made possible by lead exhibition patron Peggy Sinclair and Murray Brooksbank and supporting sponsor the Hal Jackman Foundation with additional support from Kayleen Hayworth, Jane and Peter Maroney and the Nixon Charitable Foundation. I would also like to acknowledge the support of Rahm's exhibition, Royal Exhibition Circle. And before we begin, I need to ask you all to silence your phones uh, so that we can all enjoy the, the program tonight. And I will now invite my colleague, Dupali Dewan, Dan Mishra, curator of South Asian art and culture to the stage to introduce our special guest tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Jennifer, and good evening to everybody. Thank you for spending the evening with us here today. Um, as Jennifer said, my name is Dapali Dewan, and I'm the Dan Mishra Curator of South Asian Art and Culture. The Dan Mishra Initiative was established in 2017 with a transformative gift to explore and share the rich legacy of the Indus Valley world and to encourage a quest for the origins of human understanding and knowledge. It has allowed Ram, it has allowed Ram to establish an endowed curatorship and enhance our exhibition, programming, research, and learning activities on South Asian art and culture. I also want to thank uh, Ali Adil Khan, founder and director of the South Asian Gallery of Art and Saga Foundation for his support during Shazia's Toronto visit. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Contemporary visual artist Shazia Sikandar is widely celebrated for expanding and subverting Central and South Asian historical painting traditions and launching the form that is today called neo-miniature. By bringing historical practice into dialogue with contemporary international art, Sikandar's multivalent and investigative work examines colonial archives to redress Orientalist narratives in Western art history from a feminist perspective. She was born in Lahore, Pakistan, and studied at the National College of Art, receiving a BFA in 1991. She was among the earliest of a generation of artists who received training in historical painting styles from the region and went on to experiment with the form in radical ways. She then attended the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, receiving her MFA in 1995, where she was able to expand that spirit of experimentation through the lens of being a diasporic person. 
I remember meeting Shazia in 1997 at one of her first solo exhibitions at the Drawing Center in New York City. I was a baby graduate student. She was an emerging artist. I remember being amazed at these drawings of empowered female figures floating in the middle of the paper whose feet had roots that did not extend into the ground, but rather connected to each other in a self-reliant, self-possessed kind of way. I felt like the work spoke directly to me and about what it felt like to be a diasporic woman with the personal reserves needed for a life of mobility. Since then, I followed Shazia's progress as an artist and have been struck by her ability to create work that is constantly evolving. From playing with subject matter and format, she's moved on to playing with scale and medium and adding a self-referential quality to the work where, in true post-colonial studies fashion, it draws from the history of art while also commenting on it. For example, she created large banners for the facade of MoMA in 2000, pairing female figures from classical Indian temple sculpture and classical European art that regarded each other. They were sort of looking at each other. And they are positioned along with the words maligned monsters, a reference to scholar, scholar Partha Mitter's study on European Orientalist views of Indian art. But in the banner, I'd say, it is unclear which image was the maligned monster. She has explored the medium of video, and I'm so pleased to say that her 2006 video work called Dissonance to Detour is in the ROMS collection and was included in the debut of ROMS New South Asia Gallery in 2008. This three minute, 30 second work combines Islamic calligraphy and floral imagery that swirl together in a kind of intergalactic mandala-like abstract environment with a soundscape. More recently, she has ventured into public art with two large female figures that are a continuation of certain themes and imagery while also embodying new directions. An eight-foot bronze piece and an 18-foot piece displayed uh, one on the former on the rooftop at the appellate courthouse of the Supreme Court of New York State and Madison Square Park. As you will see for yourself, there are two exception, uh, extraordinary examples of her work made through the medium of mosaic on display now in the original Ram exhibition curated by my wonderful colleague, Dr. Famida Suleiman, Being and Belonging. Shazia has deservedly been recognized with a number of awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship in 2006, the Asia Society Award for Significant Contribution to Contemporary Art in 2015, the Fukuoka, uh, Fukuoka Arts and Culture Prize in 2022, and the Pollock Prize for Creativity in 2023. So enough of my words. This evening, Shazia will share an illustrated presentation in her own words. After her talk, we hope you'll take the opportunity to visit the exhibition tonight, which will be open until 8.30 p.m. or during your next visit to the ROM. So with that, please help me welcome Shazia Sikander to the stage. Hi everybody, good evening. It's an honor for me to be here amongst all of you, amongst all the wonderful artists that are here and the colleagues at Rome. I'm just so thrilled to um, be uh, participating in the exhibition, to have the opportunity to exhibit, to have new interpretations of the work, to be part of creative communities. So, Thank you for that. Um, you know, the <laughs> Tipali, the older I get, right? The more I see the enmeshed space of art and life, both are messy, complicated, fraught, 
They happen, they survive, and they inspire. So this continuity of art and knowledge construction is an anchor for me and for my practice. How we reckon with our otherness in a shifting world, how we approximate, reproduce, and re-enact our culture and history is really important because whatever we make, consume, and give back, it has resonance and consequence beyond our immediate lives. So how we experience creativity, how we respond to it, and how we interpret it is an open-ended premise. So I like to believe, I have to believe, that the function of art is to allow multiple meanings and possibilities to open up space for a more just world. And in that sentiment, you know, it's always this intent to create something wondrous with many possible associations, something that can generate thought and produce difference. So as a visual artist, I look at multiple vantage points when creating work. It allows me to be cognizant of binaries, to complicate assumptions, categories, hierarchies, center margin dynamics, where issues of sovereignty can be loosened conceptually, emotionally, visually, by creating multiple unexpected relationships between languages. So some years ago when I won my um, first major public artwork commission, I had to solve the inherent issue of longevity because I, I was doing mostly works on paper, which cannot, works on paper cannot be placed in light for long periods. So I started thinking of the use of light in my manipulation of paint and began experimenting with glass on a larger scale. So this is one of the early works at Princeton University. But glass was a natural direction as much of my work deals with transparency and layering. But what led me to glass was also mosaic. Uh, that led me to mosaic was glass, but what led me to mosaic was animation. It was the dynamism of the pixel that you can see here. So I, I started thinking of the unit of uh, the, the pixel as the unit of mosaic, and then somehow you know, it all clicked because I wasn't interested in just uh, reproducing an image in another medium. So then the metaphor for light inherent in glass the metaphor for strength, fragility, opaqueness, transparency, malleability, all of these wondrous things started to just emerge. And as I kind of embraced that, it became almost as if the mosaic could be animated. So this work, Ecstasy as Sublime, Heart as Vector, functions as a scroll. It's, uh, it sort of unrolls in a vertical manner and it's over. 70 feet, but it's all made from small drawings, like the one next to the image here. Its stacked up compositional structure allows for an interplay of color, shape, form, and it offers a multiplicity of perspectives to help the eye move upward. So it's all based on sketches and drawings, but then the, the material itself is in glass. And here you can see some of the drawings to scale. So there's definition of form, and yet I wanted some mystery in there. So I think my relationship to Persianate painterly, painterly traditions, especially the Safavid, is evident, especially in the richness of detail and use of light to animate forms, whether they are characterized as living or non-living. But choosing to keep the piece ungrouted was another way where I could play with the unevenness, unevenness and the varying sizes of the glass pieces, which almost perhaps was going in the direction of, of sculpture. Um, so the overarching theme of human economic interconnectivity and struggle for truth, with, you know, thoughts of refer reference to history, religion, literature are in that piece, ecstasy as sublime, heart as vector. It is, um, um, I'm not getting into all of that, but it was for me how to compose something in such a crazy vertical space that could be like a visual poem. So um, many of these uh, works, 
I chose because I wanted to also show the breakdown of form that happens in both the mosaic and the video film. But many, many works, like the lens is always a, a, a oriented towards the fem, feminine, feminine form, but also female stories, or how to think about women, like how to center women, and you know, how, how do women want to uh, talk about themselves? So my artistic process starts with reading and research, engagement with community and careful listening. Women in my work are complex, proactive, you know, perhaps androgynous at times, but definitely playful and connected to the past in imaginative ways without being tied to a very heteronormative lineage. So that's also something that I keep thinking. So here, a rose on the left is interlinked female protagonists where I wanted them to emerge like a flower. So they are untethered to any specific time or space, but they are still a critical part of the natural environment. And um, the animation, mosaics, projections, they naturally started to lead me in, in a direction where time and space became incredibly important. And I became more interested in how you know, art functions in public domain. And so even, even for this piece, which is fairly flat, um, at the Princeton University, but I was aware that it had to be, it, it's part of the economics building, so I was thinking of how to um, pull out the threads. So it deals with the history of, of uh, East India Company and how some of the same economic uh, threads run uh, through our current system. So, but the gesture, what is a gesture of a thoughtful public artwork? And that, those are things that I started to, that I, ha I have to think about at a different, perhaps different manner, but nonetheless, the ethos of that is always in every project. Like, so does a thoughtful public artwork could be about democracy, to be able to intervene in the public space to show who we are or who we can be. So I started asking, do we believe that art can allow new languages, new expressions of the diaspora? How can non-Western symbols and quote unquote other bodies, such as South Asian women, can occupy public space too? So uh, these, these, I think these are, these are like almost ideas that run in the background, sort of like a sketch, sketchbook. Recently, I had the opportunity to create uh, a, the outdoor public artwork in Madison Square Park. And you know, I had to start by reflecting on my 2D practice to find ways of moving into sculpture. So it, it very much started um, by looking at um, murals, installations, paper, and even to a degree animations, and thinking that so much of this work is so ephemeral, especially in 2021, I had a survey exhibit of my drawings and paintings on paper, which was um, at the Morgan Library organized by the RISD Museum. And I saw all this work and I was seeing so much of it for the first time myself in 25 years. So it made me reflect on on basically the stark comparison on how works of paper are treated by institutions and museums compared to paintings on canvas and sculpture. So I think it was a poignant reminder that the works I created as a very young artist would probably not be shown again for another 20 years. And in that moment, it became clear to me that I had to capture the ethos of the feminine in my practice in a medium that could bypass such institutional regulation. So that was really another momentum of thought towards conceptualizing the sculpture. But I wanted to draw these links so you can see how the, the armature is really taking the, the notion of the, of the skirt, which has been so prevalent in my work. But witness the piece on the right also involves um, mosaic. So I wanted to bring the practice of mosaic into the sculpture as well. 
And um, it's, you know, it's not a revelation that women are absent in public art everywhere. And with that in mind, when I think of this sculpture now, which is on the top of the courthouse, now, in now she gains political weight as she rises from her own plinth. Her lotus, among the nine statues of ancient female lawgivers. The other sculpture, Witness, where she's in the park at 18 feet, but she's a witness to sight and sound around her, which for me was implying listening and seeing. Witness is also woven into its environment. It's both fluid and present, because it sort of has this open, non-monumental, patterned skirt that sort of breaks the glass ceiling and gives way to transparency in revealing the grass, trees, the cityscape that spawn its environment. But both public projects are open-ended and they make multiple statements. I also had an AR lens titled Apparition done in partnership with Snapchat, which is all of these three components were part of the project titled Hava, to breathe air life. The concept of a malleable, shape-shifting, expanding space, like the skirt, had been a recurring motif in my paint painting practice since the 1990s. For me, it was a metaphoric space of collective female agency. So I started there, and to activate this theme further in scope and scale through sculpture, I took inspiration from this very spectacular Maitland Armstrong stained glass ceiling dome at the Appalachian Courthouse. Its translucency and defined architectural properties, reimagining the massive dome as a house, a space demarcating a site of renewal. And that's, that's sort of how the armature started to come together. The skirt hoists the body, which is moving upward, while breaking out of the glass ceiling. So uh, on, it is tied, on it is mapped the word Hava, which also can translate to Eve, which could be seen as the first lawbreaker, you know, just, just playfully in terms of its relationship to the courthouse. But Again, the idea of this ongoing kind of expanding skirt, the collective space where she can continue to collect baggage and keep bringing everybody into the fold and keep moving forward. Now, the sculpture on the courthouse represents the first female alongside the historical male lawgivers, allegorical, created from non-Western visual iconography as well as representing wisdom and resilience, may be a new chapter of broader representations of female empower empowerment and the multiplicity of perspectives that is the ethos or should be the ethos of New York City. So I recall standing on the street looking up at the courthouse and thinking about how the figurative sculptures of the famous male philosophers and lawgivers all looked so very much alike and in a state of disrepair. And I was like, I saw that, you know, there was this empty plinth which was once occupied by the sculpture of Justinian, and the vacancy screamed for female representation. So it was, it was again, just moving in the city and looking upward. Sometimes it helps to look upward because obviously it's such a saturated city, so there's not going to be many opportunities. So I think, as I'm sure many artists here can totally understand that for artists, you also have to make opportun opportunity happen for yourself. So that was literally the act of looking up and thinking that's got to be worth um, putting a proposal and, and taking that conversation further, which was amazing because the, um, the justices, especially Justice um, Diane Renwick, was such a huge supporter, and now she is the first presiding justice, the first female of color, the first African-American in the Appalachian Courthouse. So I was really happy to have, have been, like, um, been part of that journey in the last two, three years. So um, the, this, coming back to, I guess, the different form, forms here, I wanted to just mention this idea of the of its, I wanted her to come with her own uh, 
pedestal or her own platform. I didn't want to use the existing plinth. So that's why you saw her floating in space with the lotus, which also expresses intangible ideas of humility, awakening, clarity, the invisible roots of the lotus that lie below the depth of the water are echoed in the roots of the feminine figure, because that feminine character, as the Pali very beautifully expressed, is something that is self-rooted, so she can carry her roots wherever she goes. And it's also a comment on the collective time and space, so it's not the individual, but the, but the ability to, for women to be resilient. And so this archetype that kind of got created in my practice was also at one point questioning the fallacy of assimilation versus foreignness. And it brought me back to these uh, paintings, which there's a mosaic that is connected to the uprooted order. And, you know, again, um, just sharing how so many of the elements in the, in the direction towards sculpture are really coming from um, a, a space of painting. And, and that made me really question that, you know, what is this relationship between languages? Why can't an artist work in multiple languages? Why do I always get asked, like, why are you working in so many different languages? And I often wonder, like, do you ask maybe William Kentridge that question? So it's also like being boxed in continuously and have to perform in a certain way that, the, that you're supposed to be, like, are you supposed to be a uh, South Asian, so you have to operate in a certain way, or a miniature? It's like I've had these categories uh, projected onto me for so many years. In the beginning, it, they used to, of course, you know, I used to like kind of find ways to fight them, but then I thought, okay, the more categories, perhaps the merrier it may become. So it's also this idea of how the art offers a fluid, sensibility and what it is to refute fixedness or groundedness. And, um, and I'm really interested in that premise. Witness and now were all made from sketches. So they all started with drawing and drawing for me is like the connecting tissue for everything. And um, just wanted to kind of bring the topic a little bit on the hair. So the hair is braided into spiraling Horns, and you can see that I've, I'm just picking it up from past work, so Pleasure Pillars, where I had wanted this uh, image as a counter to the very um, paternalistic um, re war rhetoric around saving Muslim women. You know, this is 2000, 2001. So I was like, okay, this is, this is something I can play with, plus there were many symbols of the horn throughout the courthouse on the furniture, in the facade frieze, and um, in many ways. So I just wanted to say that it was, it's not a uh, image of Medusa. <laughs> Here you can see where some of the inf inspiration comes from. It's very diverse, but of course, you know, we there's syncretic visual histories in Africa and Asia, so there's many, the world is huge, that we, we are not all you know, in service to Western art history. But that does not mean that we don't participate in it. We, we, it's like, I, I'm just tired of these sort of silos and divisions of that, that place artists in these ways in which you can spend your entire life you know, just stuck in those categories. But at that time, you just realize you just keep making work and and that's all you do as an artist. So I'm, I'm, don't take me wrong, I'm super grateful for um, having um, opportunities and to, to have the freedom to, you know, to be a creative person, to be able to engage with creativity and to, to be inspired with so many wonderful thinkers and mentors and whether it's in literary spaces or poets and writers. So a lot of my work really kind of takes uh, uh, inspiration from like Audre Lorde, Angela Carter, Isma Chuktai, Sol Man Sharif, um, Fahmida Riaz, Adrian Rich, Claudia Rankin, 
Parveen Shakir, like it's just so many wonderful um, um, women thinkers that assist in new ways of thinking, reframing history, imagining new possibilities as part of the broader processes of transformation in a society. And they offer counter perspectives to our very prevalent, hyper-masculinized histories and ways of being. Um, representation of women as active agents in traditionally patriarchal spaces, and especially spaces that are centered on delivering justice and educating power, is a much needed restorative in civic life. So throughout literature, the notion of the female has been in conversation with the visible-invisible divide, the feminine as the monstrous, the abject, the fecund, the immense, the vulnerable, intimacy, selfhood, valor, resistance, you know, femininities, intersections with race and war are basically the biggest markers of the fear that lurks when boundaries start to melt. So that's, that's, that's that like space that I really want to explore is when you push at boundaries, what starts to happen? Not just as fodder for my own work, but how people behave and respond. There's always the threat, the, the fear that lurks there is so, um, it gives you insight and, and that, how do you anchor that or how do you, how do you use that as subject matter? Because it's so, um, it's just, you know, it's, it can't be like, you, I'm not interested in illustrating it, but I'm interested in, in getting, understanding its DNA. So, so much, so much of my work has always kind of thought about that with, uh, even in terms of, uh, um, the idea of mystery, what it means and, and how to, how to think about things that have left or gone and what is a ghost or, you know, the Chalaba is a ghost here, but it's also about erasure. It's also about things that are so swift and transient that you can't pin them down. So whether it's the resistance years ago towards the kind of, you know, the same old categories, are you Pakistani, are you an artist, are you a painter, are you Muslim, are you Asian, are you Asian American? Like, it's just like, okay, after a while, it, it doesn't really matter. But this lexicon that got evolved and was all, uh, I, I felt that I could revisit and, and, and revisit it for collaboration. Some forms and ideas speak instantaneously even to music and movement. And when I started to think in that way, then I was like, oh, I need to collaborate with a composer or I need to really activate, the, uh, activate a score based on, on the text that a poet will um, sing in the piece. So, so things that are already happening in the 2D started to sort of emerge out of the paper and leave the paper as if they didn't want to no longer be entrapped in those representations. And that started to happen. It continues to happen, but there was a moment when it was very intended to break those boundaries. Being able to move in and out of glib categories of nationalities to observe from both sides, inside, outside of the shifting divides, it allowed for dissonance, for tension. And in that process, um, you know, I just maybe will share a couple of works that like this piece, Kindred, is, uh, it's I think nine or 10 feet, but the face, here, the female face emerged from the ink drawing when I was painting um, Africa, which is now upside down in the, in the painting. And of course, it hints at the novel by Octavia Butler. But the notion of the sea, the large oceanic space around the globe is constructed with Urdu that speaks to the immense and the fragile and their interdependence through repetition and layering. So the multi-meaning phrase, Ghalibs, informs that the work of an artist is never done. A play on wrote, the work questions the paradox of learning against the enigma of incompletion. The text is upside down intentionally to play with the intersecting illusion of water and writing. But when I took a picture of human clutter in space, it was like there was this uncanny connection to the drawing that I had made, but I had when I was making this work, I was thinking about feminine in nature as a hope 
for environmental catastrophe. And you know how how like the fem, how does the women agency function as agents of change? So um, going a little bit further back in time, many female iconographies, you know, they can these repertoires of forms, figures, they emerged during a period when I was creating multiple, numerous, fast ink drawings, and uh, sometimes they have these um, appendages, and they can be. Um, they can become almost text-like. But I was interested in this collection of alter egos and um, also understanding the dynamism of form. Form is something alive and in conversation with its time and space and language. So it was a process of working from memory as well as the study of historical manuscripts. I was not following any particular script of how to respond to my interest in the manuscripts, but to work intuitively. So there's a lot of things going on, the knitting together of references, mythologies, more private inner encounters, dreams, fantasies, everything giving birth perhaps to an exploration of, the, of this idea of power and powerlessness. So that sort of pendulum of tension. But you know, going back to the 90s, to locate the brown South Asian representation was pretty hard. It was the th it was basically just the third world feminism, and you had to figure yourself out in that um, monolithic category. So I I had to play with humor. Um, so the female as an outlier was all along in my earliest works as well. So even in this work from the mid 80s, the scroll, where you see the young woman stepping over a threshold symbolized as a frame. She's taking herself and others, the viewer, into a journey, into an epic poem, possibly through a contemporary luminous space. She's restless, diaphanous, hovering between the familiar and unfamiliar. She's passing through time, but not being rooted in the moment that the other characters exist. So of course, I made it, you know, it's in my, um, um, in, in a long time ago, <laughs> but uh, um, so I, 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 when I think of it now, I can still find uh, interesting ways of, of reading this work, because uh, towards the end, well, there's a children's book on the piece now, but towards the, uh, you can also see it's connect, how um, it's like dissecting uh, Safavid interiors, but also contemporary architecture like Nayar Ali Dada in Pakistan. So I was, I, I, I was looking at many things and uh, how to think of detail but not clutter, how space can expand and contract. Um, basically, how to transform miniature paintings status from traditional and nostalgic to a contemporary idiom. You know, that became almost like a personal goal, especially after the success of the scroll. Because um, I carried that burden as a young um, artist, especially in the mid-90s in the US and in the West, when Indo-Persian miniature genre was not familiar in the contemporary international art world. But in the time of like engaging, you know, they are there are much more, there are more earlier interests in the female, but perhaps I'm 18 making this work, so its ideas are still not fully evolved. But I think even then I was looking at architecture, going into um, a, a Sikh Havelis or thinking about colonial spaces differently. But I think I was looking at many things, like even Akira Kurosawa's use of multiple staged motion. So you know, it's it's um, it's not all David Hockney, because <laughs> oftentimes it's like, okay, that's that must be it, because he was looking at uh, scroll painting. So anyway, they, it's always interesting to have distance from one's own practice and to say, no, actually, this is how it is, but. Oftentimes, it's like people have said some things, and that that seems to like make the work run in a different direction. But painting to me is like the form of an epic poem. There is um, a natural depiction, a narrative of time, a film, an unfolding of an event, a story, a day, a lifetime. I worked on this for two years, 
sometimes 14, 18 hours a day, you know, maybe, yeah, it was very, like, you didn't make many friends and you became a hermit, which is, I wouldn't advise that, but I don't think it will work it now in, in our social media generation. But this era of the 1980s under the military dictatorship, you know, was, was important. There was something else going on, and I was really inspired by the women around me, Pakistani women activists, artists, poets, many of my female friends. So when I think of it, I'm thinking endless inventiveness is the women's space to, to understand dissent in creative ways, how to push back. And so, you know, so I can see how this work is still connected to the scroll. There's the red fence, which is there, which is in, in the painting throughout too. So my commitment to miniature painting stems from my desire to diversify a predominantly Eurocentric art history and to question the entrenched organizing principles of museums with regard to what is contemporary or historical. What got me deeply hooked was understanding how European colonial legacy shaped manuscript paintings fate as many South Asian manuscripts were dismembered and sold for profit during colonial occupation. So many historical paintings of Central and South Asia reside in collections, as we all know, in the British Museum, V&A, Met, Royal Windsor Library, you know, many, many. So that's like having access, which I think many people in, in the Global South won't. So that privilege doesn't, you know, I'm aware of it but it still is shocking that you go into the storages and you realize that so much of the work that exists there has never been um, archived and thus it exists you know, as a ghost. Till it gets archived, there's never budgets or there's so much of it that we will never see. So that really, like when I started to understand that, that also made me think about this idea of storytelling, research, book, how to disrupt it and how to disrupt that space, what did it mean for me to understand um, the concept of, of, of a book and how book can carry so much and yet book has been dismembered and the violence inherent in the dismemberment, etc. cetera. Um, so, so much of that led to me curating shows. So this was a show I curated at the Cooper Hewitt Museum and you know, for me, Research, again, is the way I move forward in time and space. And disruption as rapture is also another example of, uh, of how the questions at the core of how can the painting shift? So here we are talking about the book in the vitrine, a historical painting, Gulshane Ish, Rose Garden of Love, which is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Like, how can that painting shift its towards something else that it engages the issue of time? How can art remain valid over time across different languages, geographies, and histories? Where does the power lie in an image? How is time visualized in an artwork? Does art create new ways to experience time? How can a painting erode its historically produced reality, its value-giving, mediated structures? So what role does repatriation of objects with suspect provenance play in the accountability of museums? So all of these things are rushing when you go into the archives. So it's not just one thing. It's like all these things that you have to let them simmer and then say, OK, what can I do with it? How can I activate all of it? How can I create something which at uh, has to, my, my service is as an artist, I have to create something that will, uh, that people will enjoy seeing and experiencing. So it also cannot, it has to speak, you know, to the senses too. Um, so that this is just uh, disruption as rapture because it got so much love in Toronto. So I was really happy. We showed it at the Nuit Blanche Festival. And then it has had so many different iterations. And of course, moving away from, not moving away, making the paintings, but then having the digital um, a space of that work allowed me to keep it even more porous. So the score was performed by the choirs in Pakistan with Jiyun and Ali Seti. And 
So like, you know, the autonomy of others can be present in my practice, and I find that very um, rewarding as a direction of how I see real collaboration, where everybody gets um, their space and their language, but it's built over time with trust, and a lot of, a lot of time is invested in those relationships and respect towards other artists' work and not, you know, and there has to be chemistry. So, so that I really enjoyed understanding that direction. Because you have to, like, when I first started doing animation, that was, there wasn't even HD. It was 2000, 2001, and I, I was supposed to make miniatures. And I was getting punished. No, you can't do this. Only make miniatures. And I was like, you know, I, so it took 20 years for that work to finally get seen and shown, and I just have a show opening at, in the Amtrak station. So it's just like, it's at, in those years when you're like feisty and young artists, you're always like, oh, what, why, why is there no language for some of the work that you're doing? But you yourself are growing and learning. So um, I wanted to just sort of move into some other works where you can see the connection of the, the space like really exploding outside of the museum into a different domain. And then some coming back into painting, coming back into um, questions of memory and this struggle and conflict, migrancy, tradition, you know, basically ultimate frame against which experience unfolds, which is death and its opposite life. So in that space, I see many works, recent works in the last 10, 12, 15 years, like Parallax, Oil and Poppies, Fled, Sub Blues, they are all critique and me meditation on symbols of extraction with links to nature, to imagination and art as sources of abundance, as opposed to the des desiccating logic of extraction. So that's what this whole series of these large-scale trees is sort of playing on this idea of the Christmas tree, which is basically a name given by uh, the, uh, I think it was the British Petroleum Magazine that I first encountered calling oil rigs as Christmas trees. So I played on that and, and made these different uh, 12 trees for each season. And in there is the one that I think I might just focus on land of tears but you can see like all of this is all is done freehand it's all ink and gouache and this poppy flower then became also the drawing which led to the um to to the piece which is in the show here but i just wanted to show how things migrate through different um, but they're all connected, but again, I think they migrate, but they are connected by drawing. Um, Land of Tears is here, and it's uh, basically, um, again, kind of putting the feminine against the tragedy of capitalism, and thinking about natural resources, depletion, and thinking also in terms of the female being the redemptive possibility. So in Land of Tears, the gifts beneath the trees are these two female forms, one living, one skeleton, holding on to one another for affirmation and support. So that was a detail, but it's a large uh, drawing. Then um, just sort of, again, um, you know, the politics that are always there being Asian, Asian anything <laughs> in the West. What does that mean in that paradox of being invisible while standing out? And how it's such a broad racial category in which so many different nations, ethnicities, classes, cultures, histories, communities, languages have to vie to be recognized. So I was like always, like even if I just think on that, that's going to like make me dream of you know, so many different iconographies that I won't be able to, I'll need another lifetime. So it's like broad themes can be so generative 
And I always sort of start broad and then figure out how to, how to keep the narrative open-ended while the language can be quite precise. And that's my way of saying a spontaneous response to a difficult situation. So a lot of ink comes in and goes, I think because it has uncertainty, it has flux. These are an ongoing exploration between material, between iconographies, forms, power, powerlessness, movement, time, formats. It's a means of imagining and bringing forms to life. So space, velocity, magnitude, direction, which are all inherent and are essential elements in the process of making you know, marks or drawing, they become beautifully active in different ways through thought and action, through animation, through music, through poetry, through composition, through collaboration, through light projection. But they are, at their, at their core, is a, this beautiful thing which I often think of as the space of the overlapping diasporas. So it's not just one diaspora, there are multiple diasporas within within those divisions and then across race. So what is that intimacy? How to explore that? And, um, and then all these sort of like, these are ongoing drawings. Some will stay in their form. Some will lead. Some will function as material for, for my research. Some I will scan. And, and as I scan them, then the, at very high DPI, then I can really zoom in and take out details and thread them together and develop narratives and make animations. Then people have responded to my work in ways that they are free to respond and that has also been an incredibly wonderful journey and, and the generosity of opening the space. So when, when I was a young artist, I would think like, oh my God, I'm limited by making these drawings because I make the drawings myself, I don't have people sitting there making the miniatures for me. So I, it would be like, it would take seven, eight, 10 months to make one and you can't survive at all like that. So obviously it, it was always like the issues around the f labor, around the fetishization that happens on, on artists from engaging with non-Western visual traditions. Like I wanted to demystify that and to really think for myself in the process simultaneously to break down those uh, 19th century scholarships that tend to, you know, kind of put more silos around uh, historical South Asian uh, works. Like that, that's my opinion as a visual artist, but I, I, I love going into the archives and then I can, I can almost like, I, I'm so moved looking at some of the older paintings, like they speak to me as if, the spirit is still alive, and I feel like, how, how am I linked to that? Can I take the freedom as a visual artist to connect to it? And I, I refuse to believe that there are no female miniature painters historical, there has to be. So, so in that sort of freedom, when art history has been oftentimes so restrictive, as an artist, I can take a lot of freedom in and think about the relationship between El Greco and um, you know, uh, Farouk, Farouk Chela, for example, and think that they were born around the same time, they, they must know each other. So if I wanted to do a project where they, they, they were lovers, like I have the freedom to do that. So I think when I started to think like this, it became really exciting. So, but all of this is happening simultaneously in the act of making itself to so the drawing is not just an, a way to illustrate an idea. In the act of making the drawing, the ideas are, are running you know, uh, uh, at a different speed. And I, I'm really, like, I love that. That's why I think um, 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 material, all these intersections are, are, are valid. And, uh, even works like this, like this I did before 9-11, but you know, again, this work is still very pertinent. Somebody just wanted to talk about this work in this current moment, and I was like, listen, I made my work 
God knows, like in 20 plus years ago. And once the work, an artist makes the work and it exists outside, I don't really have ownership to it. And, um, and, and I think that's really important as artists to know that we have to believe in, in, the, in the significance of, of, of making art. And um, uh, so these sort of motifs that are trenchant, they can be historical symbols, how do they, how can I give them shifting identities? you know, to cultivate new associations. And um, Parallax was very much about that. It was about the contested histories of colonialism, mechanisms of power, cultural authority, tensions around the control of Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf. So looking at the maritime trade, looking at the movement of resources and commodities such as bodies and oil and naval warfare, East India Company, Imperial Air, land travel routes, there was so much to really read and explore and then still come back to the drawing board and think how can you portray all of that through a you know, a language which is really born out of ink and gouache. So that, that's, that was really a tough place to be in, but it, it became, you know, it, it, as it grew, then as the composer and I started to travel together, and as we, uh, as I traveled, it was for the Sharjah Biennial, but as I traveled in the area, I also um, came across the research led to the work in multiple ways where, it, you know, came across um, this abandoned theater in which the caregiver who was living illegally, well, technically his visa was still attached to the architecture, and he had come in 1976 to build it as a laborer, but he was living there, and it was an abandoned theater, and he was from Pakistan, and our chance encounter, and then I was like, I gotta do some last show for him, and in that way, in that process, I you know, I came, I kind of encountered a format for myself that it had to be a cinematic film that I was going to make. So drawings, projecting the drawings, working, scanning the drawings, scan, working at different scales, um, thinking about different um, iconographies that can convey history, encountering things in other people thinking about migration, thinking about labor, thinking about the, uh, the region, thinking about language, the relationship of Arabic to, to many Muslim countries, thinking about the proximity of Pakistan to the region. Like it was just, there was no one way. And I think that is basically all of that is there. But when I, but material is important also. So, um, when I think of that animated work, I'm thinking that the black ink is almost like the oil, which is oozing out of all the perceived orifices, the cracks in the gouache, the armature. Equating ink with oil, then oil with movement, movement with time, time with history, and history with hierarchy, I was linking material with matter, drawing with thinking, and power with natural resources. So oil signifies the rupture. Once unleashed, it is impervious, seeping into all facets. But obviously it's not literal, it, it's the ink that is allowing me to think like that. And, of, and I was also able to work with poets who, who wrote beautiful poetry, then all of that becomes part of the score. Which brings me to this idea of language and geography. How language and geography incorporate charged notions of inclusion and exclusion, always in flux. So when I'm thinking language, I'm also thinking um, Urdu, because Urdu and English have been part of my um, you know, thinking process, growth, growing up in Pakistan, what it means to, to have like so much colonial history and baggage. And so this work, which is basically English or Urdu written together, entwined, and uh, in, as, as I was writing, the X was created. And then recently I was working, somebody, a young Pakistani PhD scholar, Heather Shabazz, wrote this wonderful thing on this work where he wanted to think about language, nationalism, and anti-colonialism 
uh, by uh, delinking Ghalib and Malcolm X from these national struggles, struggles that are bounded by the parameters of the modern nation state, and instead see them as two points in a history of shared earth, a history that emphasizes comparisons, affiliations, and associations that exceed the nation. So I'm just super excited that, you know, that there is a different generation of, of, of South Asian writers that are, that may not necessarily be writing within the art world as art critics, but they are really wanting to write about the art. And I, I'm, I'm really ex happy to have that because when I was their age, there was, there was no such thing happening. There were very, there was hardly anybody but there were people, but they were not being invited or included. So that was just a little thing I wanted to sh express. And uh, this idea of the particle system, which is in the mosaics in the show, but also here in all the early animations where the body disappears and it leaves its mark behind. And here the hair is left, then it, it is small enough that it can be a DNA of the work and it can have multiple associations, like it can be birds and bats, it can, it can move in different directions. And, and that idea for me is really quite beautiful that I can um, take a, a detail and the detail taken from a drawing or painting can, carries the DNA of, of that work, but also of a broader thought. And that, thinking like that, I was like, okay, what if I take that detail out, which is in this painting done again many years ago, and pull that out and see what happens. So that was the first way in which I, I launched into sculpture. So I took the image from Intimacies and I pulled it out, and that's the promiscuous Intimacies which was in conversation also with Gayatri Gopinath. So, you know, again, like it's, it's wonderful to revisit, but also with other South Asian scholars. So the sculpture with its very sinuous entanglement of the Greco-Roman Venus, the Indian Devata, you know, it's, it's talking about the complex, difficult, fraught issues. And that image on the right was a poster image for South Asian galleries at the Met for, for decades, when I identified it, that was in 1999, and now it's recently been returned. So, you know, they, so I find that also super exciting that intuitively artists are always going into directions that are not that straight, and they often, you know, they, they can't be, they're not narrow definitions. So this, this work has now even more um, uh, more meanings that can be read into it, but both of them don't look at each other, and it's not clear who is in a position of power and who isn't. But it's their suggestive embrace, the entwined female bodies that carry the symbolic weight of communal identities from across multiple temporal geographic terrains. And, and it was, you know, it was a sketch that I pulled out, but then I had to account for all the dynamics of the, of, of what, how, how I had to compensate for the missing sides. So 2D is so forgiving, but 3D meant I had to work with models and then m move it in that direction. And so it's still, it's connected. It's connected in so many ways to now. And um, another work, The Last Post, but here it's, it's also on glass. The, this is also reworked through animation and metaphorical association, referencing the colonial history of the subcontinent and the British opium trade with China. So there is also this idea, there's, you know, the, the character there is Adam Smith, who has grown wings and, uh, is, and is stuck with his lofty ideas in the in the glass and the economics building in, in um, at Princeton. So it's another piece that I'd done there. But um, so it's also like how to tie the last post to a quintuplet effect and to see how the works can be a, a 
they are both works were a metaphor for societies in flux. But I was also thinking about the language of the company school when I was looking at the color and um, um, uh, visual histories and languages, but also like stylistically kind of riffing on it and then thinking how to subvert it. So the protagonist is this East India Company man who appears in various guises throughout the piece often as a lurking threat in the imperial rooms of the Mughal Empire. So um, this, this is a separate work, sorry, but the world is yours, the world is mine. Here I'm looking again at death and storytelling through the perspective of bringing miniature painting in conversation with uh, hip hop. So it's Nasser Jones and, um, uh, uh, and sort of looking, looking again at multiple ways of creating alignments with, with other artists, with other languages. But I wrote the piece for this painting. It's in, it was uh, published in New York Times, so if you wanted to get into it, I won't. Um, sorry, moving forward. I, um, I just want to make sure I have a little bit of time I wanted to show uh, a recent work which is uh, in, was done in Times Square a couple of weeks back, and I have like a, a short one minute video and maybe another minute of the performance that was done again with my long term collaborator Jo Yun. But in that piece, we had Zay Bungash um, uh, do the lyrics, but actually, we had created our we had we were all traveling. We were in Pakistan in 2018 when we recorded it. But again, it was never intended to be done for a fixed thing. So the opportunity came recently. So we ended up performing it in Times Square. But um, you know, again, all of these things they allude to the interstices, the transitory, the mythos of the migrant, the citizen, the women and power the colonized, like all of us artists, we all are artists, like all of us that are caught between worlds, between artistic vocabularies, cultures, practices, histories, what is that in-between space? We all have that in-between space. And I think when I think like that, then I can really think about this work, Reckoning, which is um, uh, the last work that I have here in my presentation. It was made from multiple drawings, it reveals the cyclical theme of struggle through kinetic forms. It reflects upon relationships that embody a moment of reckoning. Um, this, this kind of shifting morphing nature is also coming from a history of doing these large scale uh, installations with paper and murals and you know, for a long time I used to do large scale murals with uh, many different artists with graffiti artists in, that I, I met, Margaret Kilcarran, Barry McGee in San Francisco, worked with them, then drawings like large-scale murals in Yorba Buena, then at other places, and then started to incorporate paintings over them. And so there's a whole history of this work, which was very ephemeral. And I, it was done on site, painted over, and then it was gone. And though there was no iPhones, nobody was taking images. So, so much of this was like so much labor that is, that is there. And I'm just glad that I have some 35 mm slides to at least, you know, be aware that, oh, I did that. And, and so when I had this exhibition at the RISD Museum that traveled to the MFA Houston and Morgan Library, they wanted me to pull out the archives. And I was like, I actually don't have so, so much of this work. So, I then, some of those images of me painting, drawing, I basically revisited it to create the piece. And, um, and, th and you know, some of this, the paper that I use doesn't exist anymore. A different version exists, but it's very canary yellow and I don't like it. But um, I, it just shows you how, like this work, drawings in the back, drawings in the front, and, and it just becomes like this physical presence of, of paper that moves and 
has a sound to it and it can it's only tied at the top so its physicality also gives a, a different sensibility to the idea of very something which is fragile and moving and is borderless at the same time and i like that that it, the intention intention was to use to make work which was fluid and uh, and in that way, you know, it's the same thing as like thinking about drawing as libretto. That makes, you are challenged by that idea that when you start to equate drawing with libretto or drawing with something that cannot be, um, that is, that's gonna move and change in time. So this is the work, uh, Reckoning. And, um, oh, these are current works I'm working at Pace Editions just making paper and working with paper pulp directly. And Reckoning was recently shown at the Times Square and right here. And I don't, I, we can show the animation too, but um, maybe we can just look at those two minutes uh, of video work. One of it is right out of my phone, so excuse its uh, quality. But I just want to end at this, that the relationships, you know, between people, relationships between histories, between forms, between languages, and between all of us as collaborators, it lives both within the work that we do and outside. And I think it's really important that when, you, when we open these boundaries and make them porous, that all of us benefit in opening up wider representations. So thank you. Thank you, Shazia. It was wonderful to end with the with the visual moving images. Um, thank you, Shazia Sikander, for your talk and for the wonderful work that is included in the exhibition here at Ram. Um, for those of you who are interested in further exploring um, Shazia's practice and her works, 
You can um, see that in the Being and Belonging publication, which is available in the ROM boutique or online. And as um, Dipali was mentioning, the exhibition is now open in the Roloff Benny Gallery, and it will be there until January 7th of um, 2024, so please do come back and see it again. Um, if you're able tonight, please see the exhibition. It's open just for you until 8.30 tonight. Um, members of the ROM team will be out there and can direct you to the space. Um, but right now we have some light refreshments in the rotunda right outside of the theater. Um, but thank you again. Thanks for coming out on this rainy night and uh, have a good evening.